Hi everybody, welcome back to the studio. Thanks very much for all your comments last week. Um, it was great to read through them all and I'm glad you enjoyed the social history of the sign. Um, this week we are going to carry on cleaning the residue of the lettering and we have got some sign writing to do as well to put those letters back and then we start putting everything back together. So um, yeah, without further ado, let's, um, let's carry on. So last week I started to remove the vinyl lettering from the sign and there was glue residue left on the letters and left on the sign itself. So we did a number of tests to see which solvents would remove that glue and I've got my mixture now. So this mixture is just removing the glue residue from the sign. Um, it's leaving the paint intact and if you remember I outlined the letters before I removed them so that I could replace them. So to replace these, rather than put vinyl back up, which will deteriorate um, with the weather. I mean, the technology has probably advanced quite a bit since the uh, early 80s. But I've spoke with the client and we think the best thing to do will be actually sign write the lettering back on to replace it. So this is something that I've always wanted to do. I have never done before. So I've been doing a lot of research online to find out the best way to do it. Just in case you forgot how big this was. I imagine if you were fighting Ali, this is how big it would have felt. What do you think? 10 seconds? I reckon. Right, let's carry on. I'm gonna take all this off, all down here, and then clean the glue residue off. Some of these bits still need sanding, so uh, that's what I'm on with next. Let's go. I'm surprised these letters didn't blow off in a strong wind. They, they're coming off so easily. I imagined that they would tear and rip and just have fragments left, but they are moving quite easily. Um, these letters would have been hand cut with a scalpel blade from vinyl. Um, it could have been a self-adhesive vinyl, or it may well have been had um, an adhesive applied. Um, a good friend of mine uh, served his trade sign writing and he used to cut all these by hand so now everything's laser cut or CNC cut however they do it um, but you can imagine how long this would have taken to first draw out all those letters by hand get the scale right and then to actually cut them from the vinyl so again all the yellow glue has to be removed so the solvent is doing a really good job of just taking that off and you can see how bright the paint is underneath there where the letter has been covering and also where some dirt has been caught as well so where there's been little rips or tears the dirt has congregated so I'll be removing that as well and this is all the residue afterwards so these are all the letters that have come off you can see how it's taken the shape of the wood there as well. And really I'm surprised it lasted so long. Look, you can see the original cuts here, the hand cuts where they've put the blade through. And great letters, such a, such a kind of 80s font as well. You know, I don't know what font that is, someone will know. But yeah, such a standard kind of font. So, as I said, I've been doing a lot of research on sign writing and lettering, so I've practiced first I've done a bit of a mock-up to get my consistency right so the the enamel paint that I'm using does get diluted down a little bit with linseed oil there's various different techniques you can use and then you get different kinds of brushes so these are chisel brushes so they have a very flat edge um, and these are quite small ones so when I've got the consistency of the paint right I did my practices as I said and then my plan is to get those letters outlined first so if the paint's flowing well this will be a fairly straightforward process of getting those curves right but as I said something I've not done before and hoping that I do a good job. So all you professional sign writers out there please be kind. Um, I 
and that's my homemade, I think it's a mall stick they call it. So it's a paintbrush with some foam on and a cloth and some picture wire and picture cord. And I probably made that about 10 years ago. And every now and again, I might replace the cloth on the end. But this just allows me to lean onto the work without touching anything or getting my hands smudging anything. So once I've got the outer edge in, then I can start blocking in the rest of the letter. And the paint does flow really nicely. So I'm trying to do it in sections. So coming around the corner, not the corners, the curves, and doing as much as possible, then letting the brush do the work. Tidying up any areas as I go. And it's quite therapeutic as well takes an awful lot of concentration to get those curves in and it's at this point that I realized I should probably have a different sized chisel brush for blocking in it's maybe something at least twice the size of this but hey ho the other thing I'm conscious of is those brush edge lines that are in there as well so they are kind of spreading a little bit but I'll probably go around those and smooth those out as well it may well need a second coat just see how it dries so I'm just going to smooth those out as much as possible and that's one letter done so the next one has got a curve at the top and then I'm just going to try and bring that round and then get that straight edge in. There's some great resources online for sign writing and sign writing tutorials where they show you all the materials that you do need and it's become quite popular recently. I've seen lots of um, people on Instagram um, showing their work and I know there are courses up and down the country in England especially and even so in America there's um, lots of people who are keeping this craft alive so obviously sign writing was a, a craft that um, was well established and then as the technology progressed it moved on to the vinyl lettering so in a funny way it's kind of harking back to more traditional techniques maybe that's just more how my practice works But yeah, the, the concentration that this takes. I don't think I took a breath throughout all of these letters. <laughs> but as I've progressed, um, you start working out how this all works. You get more confident in your shaping. Um, so yeah, that's the first word boxing done. Quite pleased with that. I'm going to let that uh, dry. I'll tackle the club and then see where we're up to. So yeah, best part of a couple of hours work there, um, really enjoyable. It's going to take a second coat as well, but um, yeah, I'm pleased with that. Let me just flip this over. So as I got my eye in there, the curves and the shapes were easier to replicate and I started to understand how that font was working. Um, so yeah, I'm pleased with that. Just the moss side to do now. But first, time to give my eyes a rest and we'll have a little bit of a break. Phil led by example and worked tirelessly to make the gym and his boxers successful and in the early 1990s purchased and renovated the whole of the building with grant aid funds to create a state-of-the-art local fitness centre. The 80s and 90s were dark times for Moss Side. On the streets outside the gym, turf wars between the infamous Doddington and Gooch gangs were raging. But throughout it all, Champ's Camp remained a haven for the young men inside. People respected Phil and what he was doing. He used to say... Out there, let them do what they want to do. We'll do what we do in here. Phil was achieving for the area, and people respected that. Everything that came out of Moss Side at the time was negative. Nobody wanted to speak about the good work the gym was doing. But with the gym flying high, and with everyone's sight set on even greater glory, tragedy struck. 
Sadly, at the height of this success, Phil was diagnosed with cancer and after a short time passed away on the 27th of May 1994. Phil was by then a legend both nationally in boxing and in the local community. When he died in 1994, his wife Audrey opened Manchester's first women-only purpose-built gym, which Phil had designed. Both his memorial service and the opening of the Phil Martin Centre were attended by crowds of people who knew and loved him. The Phil Martin Centre are currently looking to have a statue erected of him um, in memory of all that he achieved for Manchester and the Moss Side area. Um, I will put a link to the website about this in the description below. So, as you can see now, I'm in the flow. The paint's doing what I want it to do, and I've got my technique down. A bigger brush would have been um, advisable, but yeah, I'm really pleased with how this is looking, how the lettering's coming on. Yeah, it's looking good. So yeah, massively sped up. I was trying to remember how long each letter took me, I kind of did work it out. Um, but again, this is first coat, and then I'll come back and apply a second. And there we go, looking good. So even though this is just the first coat, you can see how bright that is now and has lifted the whole sign. It is massive, this. And then you can see there's a lovely sheen to it. It's got a lovely glossy finish to it, um, which will only improve with that second coat on. And now I've got to tackle the rest of the piece. Okay, so that's second coat done of the lettering now, as you can see there, um, that's dried. And I'm going to start retouching in some of these areas here where we have uh, got those holes that we filled before. So I'm going to use uh, oil paints to do this and I'm going to match that colour of, um, of the background. So I'm just going to start retouching those areas in. So I think the original sign was household paint. It could well have been gloss on there. Here's my filled areas that I've sat, sanded down. And you can see there's also bits of paint loss there. These kind of like vertical fissures, if you like. Um, so I'm going to be quite liberal with my paint here because I'm going to try and do two things at once. I'm going to cover the, the damaged areas and the retouchings, but I'm also going to kind of dry brush into those cracks. So I'll be using a fairly thick and stiff brush just to get a good covering of paint on there then i'll be just kind of brushing over gently and the pigment will be filling those cracks if you like and making that whole area look a little bit more solid again so compared to my usual restoration techniques and retouching techniques it might seem a little bit excessive but i do want to fill those little areas you can see again there in the top left on the blue the, the plywood coming through where the, the paint has raised so it's just a matter of touching those in and the same with these areas here I'm going to touch in those little bits of sanded areas and those dots um, I didn't actually film it but I want to come back over and blend that in a little bit more with some of those um, roughed areas on the top and the same with this here matching in the texture and those highlights and then just kind of matching the scumbled black brush strokes as well I'm quite pleased with that. So yeah, I didn't capture too much of the retouching of this. I was on quite a tight deadline with this piece. I can't remember whether it was a month or three or four weeks, so I had to kind of get an awful lot done. So some of my filming was a little bit hit and miss. So the next thing to do is uh, retreat the framework. Now I've had a few comments saying that, you know, why hand sand this? Why not just use the power tool and not charge them per hour? But I have a very small studio. Sanding uh, tools in here, power tools, would just cause such a, a mess in the studio. And I'm on my own. 
it was too much to take the sign out of the mill and do it outside so that's why I decided to hand sand them and then this is the colour of the um, stain that I'm going to use so it's just an exterior wood stain that's quite close in colour to the original and I think I mentioned earlier that I didn't want to use paint because that could flake off so again chatting with the client we've decided with this red stain uh, close to the original colour and it will weather down a little bit as well so it'll go on looking quite bright but over time it will dull down and be more um, akin to the original colour if you like. So as with all these jobs, um, budgets are consideration and time. So I was on quite a tight time frame with this. And uh, a lot of the decisions that we've made were in talks with the client and you know what they wanted to pay for and what they thought was fitting for the piece as well. So I'm sure some people might have said, why didn't you replace that outer frame or why didn't you do this or use this other treatment? Again, it's all to do with time and budget and client's wishes. So that looks quite bright. You can see it's kind of jumping out, but it will tone down. But yeah, it looks fabulous. I quite like that white border on there as well, but we're going to keep things original as possible. So this is the first coat and it's absorbed in a little bit. It may well take a couple of coats on this to um, get it how we want it, but I'm quite pleased with that. It looks good. Just the second one to do now. All right, so I'm, I've done the first coat on that first one now, and because I'm on a bit of a tight deadline with this, I need to get a second coat on tonight. Before I go home, I have constructed a wonderful double decker system. Let's just show you this. Look at this. <clears throat> so, with the clever use of these wonderful boxes for an old art project. I've safely attached the top layer of the sign and now I can use this to get my second coat on. So I'll quickly get a second coat of that on tonight and then I can see where we're up to tomorrow. Okay, thought about that. Very impressed with that. So yeah, all the previous restorations were dry on there. Um, and then this just allowed me to apply numerous coats of this wood stain to both pieces at the same time. And again, you forget how big this sign is until you start trying to move it around and get it on the bench. But this uh, wood stain is applying really nicely and um, yeah, it's really freshening it up. And then this is the next day where, probably end of the day, next day, where we've got a couple of coats on there. So you can see it's got a lovely gloss finish to that now. And then the next stage with this, which I didn't capture, was applying a varnish to the um, to the actual painting. So the, the, the frames, while it was in situ there, was masked off and then I actually used um, a hydrocarbon varnish on there just to give it some kind of weather protection as well. But the majority of this is exterior gloss and exterior paint apart from the small retouchings. But this is the day before it was picked up, or the day it was picked up rather, um, ready to be installed. And it looks fabulous. So much brighter, so much cleaner. The lettering's all in place um, and really shines out now. And yeah, I'm really pleased with how it how it looks. Someone said it was painted with heart, and I agree. So if you imagine that, you know, moss side's burning, there's all the riots, Phil's trying to get the club off the ground, he goes to the hardware store, gets two sheets of plywood and makes this fantastic sign, gets someone to do the lettering for him, and then puts it on the outside of the building. And this is his calling card to get all those young people involved in the gym. He must have been so excited to get this on the wall and get it up. So here it is as it arrived at the studio. Looking a little bit worse for wear. And then this is it, finished, ready to be installed back outside. So lots brighter and um, yeah, looking in good shape. A little road trip. Manchester since the 90s has grown so much. Um, Trafford Park is hustling and bustling with all sorts of different industries, lots of service industries that are there. Amazon, of course, always present. Well, the big change in Manchester is the growth of the city centre. 
outside investment from China has seen the rise of huge skyscrapers that just keep popping up all the time. These have arrived in the last two or three years and the whole landscape is changing so rapidly. Everywhere you look there's a new tower block or luxury apartment being built. The cranes are everywhere on the skyline. This bridge here is the border, the Mancunian Way, that leads us into Moss Side and Hume. So underneath this bridge we come out of the city centre slightly into urban areas of still deprivation, still very poor areas of Manchester, back to back housing, terrace streets upon terrace streets upon terrace streets with social housing left and right. And then here we come to the Phil Martin Centre in Moss Side and we see the sign installed today. So the whole building got repainted the sign got a steel frame and it was put back up in all its glory. So this is a year on from the installation and it's holding up really well. Here is the Phil Martin Centre from the front with some new mur murals depicting him and celebrating Champs Camp. It's still a real beacon in the community and people still talk fondly of Phil Martin and all he did for the area during those turbulent times of the 80s and 90s when Moss Side was burning. Okay guys, here, here it is installed. Um, it looks tiny up there, but we know how big it really is. Um, it's so great to see it up there and in place and learn about the story of Phil Martin. Um, Phil was a great person in this area. He, um, he was a, a legend, he was, thank you. Um, and, and then the legacy that the Moss Side Boxing Club has left in Manchester is fantastic. Um, and as we can see, this place still works as a beacon in here, in this society, in this community. And um, yeah, it's fantastic. Um, right, I hope you enjoyed that episode. Uh, next week, I've got a brilliant painting for you um, with a link to one of our past characters, uh, Mr. Williamson. So I hope you tune in for that. Please hit like and subscribe, and thanks for being along. Um, as you can see, the weather in Manchester today is a little bit grim, um, but back to the studio. Thanks for watching, guys. See you later.